the functions in Scotland. Um, it's a bit of a rattle through, so I apologise if I flip through this quite quickly, but um, I wanted to try and give you as, um, as much of an overview as I can. Um, there we go. So um, I've actually removed some of the slides from this presentation that um, I'd use for some other events. So um, I will try and cover as much of this as I can, starting from the agency, that um, Scotch Forestry, that was formed just a couple of years ago. Um, so you may not be familiar with the branding yet, especially given that we've all been under lockdown for most of that time. Um, I will touch on the work that happens at the borders and in the forest to protect our trees, um, some of the statutory controls we use to, to protect our trees. And um, I will touch on a few of the issues that we have. Um, I'll leave as much Clara, um, I'll leave that to Ruth as much as possible. Um, and then I'll touch on biosecurity at the end. Um, so we're talking about roughly one and a half million hectares of woodland in Scotland. About a third of that is FLS, and you'll hear more about that later on from Alan. Um, and the remaining two thirds are privately owned and managed, so a huge diversity of private um, individuals, companies, organisations, investment um, programmes and different management teams. Um, but they're all regulated by Scottish Forestry. Um, so about 75% of that is conifers. That's including a lot of native Scots pine, of course. But there's, as all you're aware, there's a lot of Sitka spruce out there. So that's there's a lot of eggs in one basket there. So that's um, that's something that is a, a major concern to the industry. But at the same time, juggling that with all the environmental um, interests you've got with the likes of issues on Scots pine and with ash that you'll be hearing about later on. So I'm going to start by just pointing you at the direction of some of the work that we take part in as part of the UK National Plant Protection Organisation, mostly led by DEFRA, but um, we are part of that group. So there's the on the left is the UK Plant Health Information Portal, and on the right, the Plant Health Risk Register. As of this morning, there was 1,236 plant pests and diseases in the risk register. So there's a lot of work goes on to maintaining that and everything goes in behind the background, but there's both of those are um, amazing resources that we go to and they're publicly available, so you guys can go to them as well. Um, and a strategy for tree health, three levels, the borders, and then eradication if it arrives, and level three is how do we learn to live with it? So we'll, I'll try and get, go through examples of each of those. So when we mean the borders, that's what we're talking about. On the left, you've got airports. On the right, you've got seaports. A lot of commodities coming in and out from suitcases to shipping containers and trains and um, and wagons. So an awful lot of work goes in there. Top graph shows you introductions coming in year by year from 1900 to 2015. And as you can see, that um, that line is going steadily up of um, tree disease and pest introductions. Every year we're finding more things. And the more you look, the more you're going to find. But it is a direct result of globalization. You're never really more than 24 hours away from anywhere else in the world. So you can, um, it, that's a very different picture to what they were looking at in 1900. And uh, the resources that we're looking at that we're trying to protect on the bottom left there, that's, that's our tree and forest cover in Scotland, England and Wales. So you can see you're never that far away from um, suitable host plants. And there's the European context. So you've, you don't have to come in from a container, a lot of these pest diseases are arriving natural spread. So um, if it's um, jumping by either flying or windborne, it will come to us or it can come to us. Our, our island status doesn't always protect us from natural spread. And that's just a slightly hectic diagram that a colleague had prepared that I quite like because it shows the, the, um, the complexity of the situation. You can imagine things jumping around all over the place. There's a bit of chance involved, but that's always going to be the case with, um, with chance inter introductions. Now then, border inspections. I'm, I'm not going to read through the slide, but on the, the two right-hand pictures, you may or may not have noticed um, on commodities, you now see plant passports. So you'll often see if you're buying a plant in a garden centre now, you should be seeing either the um, the details highlighted on the on the picture at the top right there on the plant pot, or it might be attached on a on a tag. But that's just the details, so we get traceability. Um, and the bottom right hand picture that is 
an ISPM 15 marking on a pallet. And once you once you know to look for them, you, you'll, um, I challenge anyone to um, not walk past a pallet and see if you can find it now. These things are all over the place. This is just to prove that, um, that the wood in that pallet has been prepared along the right protocol. But it's just to give you a little um, insight into the work that goes on. Colleagues in FC do an awful lot of work um, with commodities in the Forestry Commission, do an awful lot of work at the border. Um, and AFA, and there are still challenges because you're suddenly finding that there are commodities that are coming in in the post on eBay or Amazon Marketplace or various other places, and it's just through post. So um, there are constant challenges to come around, but um, there are teams working on them, but um, it's, it's a big task. And you can see some of the issues you've got here. So these are non-compliant wood packaging. So that middle picture, you can see the timber being transported is fine, but um, the dunnage timber, so that's the material that's being either used to wedge or pack the commodities into the container or into the ship, is just bits of tree that hasn't hasn't been processed. So there's big chunks of bark on there. It's that that is um, the highest or high risk for carrying beetles um, or other issues. So the actual sawn timber is fine in a lot of instances, but um, it, it can just be this this dunnage material or the wood packaging that is is the issue. And just to give you a, um, an oversight, that's Grangemouth. So something in there's at any given time, there could be thousands of containers sitting at Grangemouth coming and going backwards and forwards. And that is that's not anything like as big as the ports on the south coast of England. So um, or for in Rotterdam for that um, for that matter. So you're gives you a wee insight into into what's coming. And that's mostly arriving into Scotland, but also into the UK. So I'll quick whistle stop tour there. Um, now into my comfort zone. So what we're doing in the forest, aerial surveys using helicopters, but also increasingly using the likes of drones and fixed wing surveys and remote sensing. We're also very, very keen to hear as much as possible from, from the sector. So foresters, ecologists, uh, uh, the interested public, um, looking at anything and everything, what we're trying to identify is, is there a concern and do we need to follow it up? There is, we have a suite of usual suspects that we know what we're doing, know what we're talking about, and we have loads of experience, but the major, or one of the concerns is there's something else out there or something's changed behavior or jumped host. Um, so we'll, we follow up on a lot of, um, a lot of unknowns and keep our eye on various sites. The good news is the vast majority of the sites in a typical year, it'll be all sorts of perfectly reasonable causes for killing a tree. Um, deer, water logging, squirrels, daft humans. We have plenty of daft humans setting fire to things and cutting things down and driving into things and and plenty of wildfire as well. We've already had a few, a few results this year where fires over the winter um, the trees are flushed, look fine, and then and then died shortly afterwards. And it, that's just behaving like a disease might. But the only way you check it, once the bracken's up, you've got to go in and actually get eyeballs on the ground. So that's mirroring a lot of work that happens in England and Wales as well. So we are um, work quite closely with Forestry Commission and Forest Research. There's an example of what we do in a typical year with our helicopter surveys covering about 95% of that one and a half million hectares of forestry. Um, we, can, we can spot a stress tree from about two kilometers from the helicopter. And, um, and the guys that we're working with have quite a lot of experience of that, but we're constantly having to train people up and bring people on. Last year has been challenging with COVID because we've not been able to operate with our usual full complement in the helicopter, but, um, but we have found ways. So the shot of the helicopter you can see in my screen there, that's, um, we weren't able to use that model of helicopter. We had to use a, a different model where there was a physical separation between the pilot and the guy in the back taking the photograph. So we, we did find a way, um, but these challenges are there to be overcome. You might be familiar with some of these photographs on the left-hand side of my screen there. That's two shots, 12 months apart from Galloway. This was from 2012 where we saw the most significant surge in Phytophthora remorum on Larch in the Galloway or in Scotland so far. I think it's probably the worst that we've seen in the UK so far. Um, in 2012, I cannot for the life of me see where the 
if there are already symptomatic trees in the in amongst the larch there. 12 months later, on the bottom left hand picture there, you can see massive dieback. That's um, happened at a huge scale. We've not seen anything like that since on that scale, but you can see the sort of damage this thing's capable of on, um, on a very short turnaround. Typically, what we're seeing when we're detecting early stages of Phytophthora remorum, top right hand picture there, it's a single dead top, either going that yellowy color or an orange or browny color. That's that's generally what we see, or you might have two or three trees. Um, and bottom right hand corner is a fairly typical example of what we're seeing. This sort of some sketchy looking pine, there's various other species not looking great, some nice looking mixed broadleafs, but there's that single larch. Hopefully you can see the pointer on the screen there. There's a single larch tree and a small group of trees in the bottom, in the shade in the bottom corner. So that's the sort of thing we're picking up. And that's um that's the challenge that we're working to. And then we have to send squads into the forest to check it out, usually felling the tree, investigating it, down to chisels onto the into the tree itself, looking for the live dead junction where the infection is, is in the bark. And we've been using these little lateral flow tests for, for at least a decade, if not longer, but most of the population are now familiar with them from a COVID perspective. But um, these tests we've we're using um, we've been using these to good effect, and then we will also send samples off to the lab if we need to for um, for PCR verifications. This is all language that the population is very familiar with, but um, it's just a standard process for us. So here's here's what we do. So top right hand corner, you've got a shot in the helicopter. Here's um, an infection in a stand of larch. This is not far from A in um, in Dumfriesshire. And a few months later, that's how you control the disease. So on this site, the larch was harvestable, it was taken down, and that risk has been reduced, that's or taken away. So before before the autumn has arrived, those trees have been taken out, and, um, and that's how that's how you get good effect to control early spotting, early confirmation, and land owner taking the necessary actions to deal with it. And from the ground. That's a pretty obvious piece of infection, but you may only get a branch or you may get early stage symptoms, might just be um, a few feet of branch and then that will then spread through the tree. Um, we, we report on Phytophthoromorum with a map once on our public web page. Then the south and west of Scotland is where the infections are at their worst. These areas are it's wetter. Um, well, it turns out not not today, but on generally, it'll be um, damper and warmer on the west coast there. So this is where we're seeing the greatest effects of the disease. Climate modelling has shown us that on the eastern seaboard of Scotland, we wouldn't expect to see the disease um, behave quite as aggressively, but we'll see how that pans out over time. But this has been something we've been dealing with for over a decade now, and we do occasionally find trees that are apparently resilient. And forest research have been working on projects to try and find out how how a, a stand of trees that is, in theory, genetically not particularly diverse. These are productive conifers that have been bred from a relatively um, relatively narrow gene pool. So we'll we'll see what um, we'll see what can be found. But the future for larch in the west coast of Scotland doesn't look great. In the east, we're a bit more optimistic. I'll move on now from Phytophthora remorum to a. Uh, beetle Dendroctinus micans, the great spruce bark beetle. This is one that's been uh, arrived in the UK in the, I think it was the 80s. It's probably in that, probably in my slide there and I forget it's just now, there's lots of information on it, but it's been moving its way from the Welsh marches north for a long time, um, for some decades. And so there's a lot of experience being built up on this. It's been slowly marching um, northwards and it's, um, it's a pest of spruce trees, so Sitka and Norway. It can it can kill the trees um, if left to do its thing. It's um, as a bark beetle, you get these sort of volcano bleeds, is the language. So in the central tree there, you'll see lots of bleeds. There's lots of things will cause a bleed on a spruce tree. Their um, sap pressure is one of their major defences. But the the female beetles will actually burrow their way in and actually find their way through the sap 
Um, here's a map of the distribution. Currently, you can see it's arriving into the central belt. Over the last five years, it's moved, moved northwards by about 50 k's, 40 k's. So it's that sort of speed it's moving. And here's, the, here's what does the damage. This is the larval gallery in the bark of the tree. That, this will form a patch underneath the bark of perhaps a foot wide by about two or three feet up and down the stem. So one gallery won't kill a tree, but by the time you've had three generations in that tree, you can start girdling it. Here's a site that was in the Galloway region on the um, top of the screen. This is the worst we've seen in Scotland. There was, um, Dendroxinus was in most of these trees that you're seeing dead there, but there was also a major drainage issue on this site. So one of the forest operations that had actually been taking place had actually resulted in some pretty serious issues with the drainage and the whole site was very heavily waterlogged. So what you found was the combination of heavily stressed trees um, and the beetle were resulting in the, the mortality. We've never seen that happen again anywhere else in Scotland because of this guy. So Rhizophagus grandis is a predator beetle. It, it will eat various other insects, but it will only breed in the presence of Dendrochnus micans larvae. So this Rhizophagus beetle is bred by Forest Research um, just outside Edinburgh. And whenever we find Dendrochnus, uh, we will dispatch a team and um, a pot of about 25 of these guys will be released on the tree and they will they will do the job of um, maintaining the dendroctinus populations at, at an acceptable level and we can actually ensure that we then don't get any further tree mortality. We don't have great um, figures on what it causes to the, the yield in the trees but the yield production, the yield loss is something in the region of one to two percent losses. Um, so the trees survive, carry on, um, and, um, and it's, it's a good success story. That took a long time to develop that. So these, these, um, these beetles are only released under license from Nature Scott. So there's a stack of work has to go around on in the background to ensure that this is all feasible. But that's, um, that's how we've learned to live with it. On the other side, we have a little, this little hairy bark beetle called Ips topographus, or the larger eight-toothed European spruce bark beetle, fairly common on mainland Europe and causing some pretty serious damage in parts of Germany and France um, and across other parts of Europe. It has, it has for years been arriving on the south coast of England on the wind, um, hasn't established. So in 2018, there was a, a breeding population was found and eradicated. And just, just last week, it was confirmed there are um, similar. This year, there have been a, a number, several populations identified, and they're all under eradication now. So the Forestry Commission um, and AF are working very hard in the southeast of England to achieve eradication again for this beetle because we do not want it to establish. It is um, another one attacking spruce trees. It's not entirely understood how, how it will affect Sitka because there's not an awful lot of um, Sitka used or planted in production forestry in Europe. In the mainland Europe, it's um, predominantly Norway spruce, but it was um, it is certainly a very aggressive feeder in the right conditions. So we do not want it to establish in the UK. We have something called the Pest Free Area in the west of Scotland that allows um, transport of conifer timber with the bark on between Scotland and the island of Ireland. There are six bark beetles we have to evidence that are absent from that area, and we do that using a whole stack of surveys, including pheromone traps, checks of checks in the forest, and that, um, and it allows us a fairly significant, it's about a quarter of a million cubic meters of timber go from that area of Scotland across to the island of Ireland every year, and that's possible because um, because we don't have those beetles, and we can demonstrate that we don't have those beetles present in that area. I, uh, Here's some pictures of some ash, but I think I'll move on from that because I'm, um, Ruth's going to cover that much more depth. I will just point you, there is a recently released ash dieback toolkit for Scotland that, um, that some colleagues of mine worked on quite extensively. So I will just point you to that hyperlink there. And just to point out, there's, there's a nice photograph I took a few weeks ago of a tree not far from where I grew up in southeast Scotland of a couple of ash trees, one of them looking very poorly and right beside it, one of them looking a little bit staggy, but still pretty green. That's this year. And that's on a site that is a few hundred yards from one of the earliest detections of Calara in Scotland. So varied picture that I've been seeing, but I'm sure Ruth will give us much more shortly. Um, biosecurity. 
here's a, a graveyard in the west coast of Scotland. All those orange trees are cypress trees that are being affected by something called Phytophthora lateralis being transported on this site and has been transported from this site to other sites, possibly in soil movements or more likely on, um, on spades or the mini diggers that are used to transport material around. So keep it clean, guys, when you're out there. There's lots of information on how you can maintain good biosecurity and understanding the effects of what you're doing, and it's all sorts of all sorts of positives. There's some good lessons, and there's some some other attempts. Here are some photographs of people sampling boots, bike tires, some more or less successful uses of mats trying to get biosecurity in the forest. A lot of the time, the mats you'll see botanic gardens in Edinburgh have got. Um, set of mats are looking in better condition than this but um, it's working out how we can how we can reduce risk and manage risk a lot of the time these mats the biggest benefit is that it means people make conscious decisions because there's a physical barrier there they, they suddenly start reading the information because the mats there so there's positives so try not to be someone that turns up on site with a filthy set of boots um, I'm sure you all don't, but um, making sure you're displaying um, good biosecurity wherever you go, and especially when you're out and about in the field, it's that leadership that you can show that either the general public or people that you're working with, um, that's the standard that we should expect to be looking after our countryside and our natural commodities. And I think that's me finished. Sorry, that was quite quick, but I think we might have a couple of minutes left for questions. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to type any questions in the chat, um, please do. Um, I was just thinking, Paddy, you were saying about observatory and tree alert. How many um, reports do you get in from that? And also, you know, the increased use of our forests and public land um, due to the pandemic, whether there's a, a bit of a education campaign around those citizen science schemes um, to, you know, to have the public contributing? So the observatory is a volunteer um, program with a, there's an awful lot of um, information on their portal for people to go to and find what's there. And I encourage anyone to join it or encourage other interested people to become a volunteer to observatory. Um, in terms of uptick because of changes in lifestyle patterns in the last 12 months, I haven't seen anything that confirms that yet. We do get um, we do get annual reports on to how tree alert is um, is seeing is the reports that are coming through. I am delighted to report that the vast majority are coming through tree alert. So people are are engaging with that and enjoying that. There are still people that prefer to phone it in, um, but there are you are we're talking thousands of reports um, across the UK. So it's um, it is being very well used. And it's and it allows us and it allows the guys in forest research a quite a valuable resource in terms of seeing what sort of host species people are looking at and what is being either under recorded or over recorded or what's in the public's eye. So it is it is a very useful resource and very helpful to see and very very good to see the public being engaged in the matters. Yeah, certainly some of the pictures you're showing of the extent of the the damage to larch there is quite incredible. You know, having seen. Probably the last time I had a, a talk on tree health was probably about eight, ten years ago. And uh, just seeing the extent, certainly on the West Coast, um, it's just quite incredible seeing the, the changes. Um, it can be quite striking, yeah. Yeah. Any questions from anyone? Was it deathly silence? We can always come back to questions at the end when we've heard from all three speakers. Um, so if you have any questions in the meantime, or oh, Julie has got one. Um, Patty, I was just thinking, you know, you're talking about border controls and having ports that we can come bring plants in, bring plants out. Um, one of the things that has occurred to me in the, the short time I have been at FLS was about timber movements from felled sites. Now, I know most of the time we're trying to take our timber to a, a reasonably local mill, but I can't help but notice that there are timber movements that perhaps maybe should be covered or or have some sort of biosecurity on that is is who, who's looking after that aspect of things or who's regulating that aspect in terms of cuts on timber leaving the forest going to the mill yeah yes of, of infected um 
of infected numbers. So if we're talking about larch, then the actual risk associated with with cut larch timber is is relatively limited in transit. So we have to risk assess all these scenarios. So um, the risk of that commodity is actually if the um, of one of the higher risk with that commodity is that when those logs are debarked in the mill, as long as that bark material isn't then used for mulching rhododendron somewhere, that would be a very bad idea. So um, those those loads of timber are actually processed at the mill as infected with remorum. So those um, so the bark chippings from that would then go for either be heat treated or typically they'll go for um, for biomass, which is slightly extreme form of heat treatment, but um, it's understanding what you can and what is a good idea to do with those commodities. Because what we don't want to do is say, you've got to burn it on site. We'd like to, it is very desirable to have that commodity still be useful because it is basically. Um, there are instances, so in with the topographers outbreak in Southeastern England, they don't have that option because you, as soon as you start moving those timber, that timber around, the beetles might start emerging, especially this time of year. So what they're having to do is burn the whole thing on site. We've done that a couple of times um, where we've had issues with, with beetle interceptions. Um, it's it's all about risk assessment. But in terms of, um, we don't we do not require loads of infected larch to be to be covered when they're moving. Um, and the needle material and the branch material gets left on site and mulched. So there's a three year biosecurity tail on each of those sites. So um, the, the the brash has to be left where it, where it fell. Hopefully that answers that one. No, thank you. Thank you, Paddy. We'll move on now to Ruth, who's going to give us an overview about ash dieback um, covering the impacts on biodiversity and mitigation, but also alternative tree species, which I know is a lot of interest to a lot of local authority ecologists when they're trying to plan planting. So to you, Ruth. That's it. Perfect. Can see it fine, Ruth. Ruth, we can't hear you. We can see your presentation. Ah, sorry about that. I had I'm muted. Classic uh, <laughs> mistake there. That's, sorry a about that. <laughs> That's a long day at work. Uh, long day at work. Uh, many a times. <laughs> yes, yes. What I was about to say was, I think I'll turn my video off. Um, so that just to save on broadband connection speed, as uh, my broadband is a little limited. But yes, right, got that the right way around. You can now hear me, but not see me, so that's good. And thank you all very much for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, I really enjoyed Paddy's talk, thank you very much. And Paddy has already shown you a graph that's very similar to this, just highlighting the rapid increase in um, tree diseases that we're experiencing in this country. And ash dieback is one of the more recent ones. As you may know, it's caused by this fungus, Hymenocyphus fraxinus, um, that's come in from Asia. And it established in Eastern Europe um, in the early 90s and has since spread across all of Europe. And many people ask us, well, what about the ash trees in Asia? You know, why, why don't they have the problems that we're experiencing? But actually, the ash trees in Asia are a slightly different species of ash. And because they've co-evolved with this fungus, although it um, does infect the ash trees, it doesn't cause the large scale death that we're seeing in the UK. Oops, I'm just trying to move on and my PowerPoint is not moving on. Let's try this. There we go. Sorry about that. So when we're thinking about tree diseases and the impacts of tree diseases, we often talk about the impact of this um, in relation to us as human beings. So the impacts in terms of the sort of goods and services we get from those trees. Less commonly do we talk about the impacts on the biodiversity and the ecosystem functioning of the woodland. And it's these aspects in particular that um, I've been concentrating on and want to focus on this evening. So I'm going to structure my talk this evening um, under these four areas. 
and firstly looking at the biodiversity that's associated with ash and it might surprise you but um, although ash is a very common tree species in fact it's one of our most common tree species uh, we didn't actually know what species used an ash tree so when ash dieback arrived and JNCC and the other sort of conservation agencies were like well what's the impact going to be and we didn't know because we didn't know what species used ash trees. So this was the first task we had. And before I go on to show you some of the results, I want to clarify a bit of terminology. When I talk about an associated species or an ash associated species, I'm talking about a species that uses that tree for food, for nesting or breeding. So like um, birds or bats breeding in the tree, invertebrates eating the tree, or for example, species that are using that tree as a habitat. So the lichens and mosses that might, you might found, find on a tree. A species will also obviously use the woodland environment that's created by the ash trees. Um, I'm particularly thinking here of the ground flora, and I will mention woodland ground flora briefly, but when I'm talking about an associated species, I'm talking about a species that uses it for the food, the nesting or the habitats. And we're not just thinking about how a species might use the tree, but also how tightly associated its relationship is with that tree. So if I talk about an obligate species, I'm talking about a species that's only found on ash. If I say it's highly associated, I mean that it's very rarely used species of an ash and then partially associated means it uses ash more frequently than its availability whereas cosmopolitan mean that's, means that the species will use ash but also uses a wide range of other tree species and it's quite important to know that level of um, the relationship between the species and the ash tree. So in conjunction with the colleagues that you can see listed along the bottom here we utilised a wide range of data sources, such as the literature reviews and lichen databases, fungal databases, to try and come up with a list of all the species that are found on ash trees. Uh, we've put together a list of 955 ash associated species. So I think this is a lot more than anybody really imagined there would be. And it's very much an underestimate. It doesn't include all the fungi. It includes some of them, but not all of them and it doesn't include any of the bacteria or the other microorganisms. And you can see how that list is broken down by those different species groups. If we think about a level of association with ash, 45 of those species are actually obligate, so they're only found on ash trees to the best of our knowledge. So if we lose our ash trees or there's decline in our ash trees, we're also looking at 45 other species that will also decline because they're only found on ash. And what's more important as well is there's a further 62 that are very rarely found on trees other than ash, those 62 highly associated species. If we move on to talk about the ground flora, um, I'm sure many of you are aware if you walk through a, a ash woodland, it's got quite a distinctive ground flora. And that's because it's got a lot of um, light demanding species um, because the shade that the ash casts is quite light. So as ash trees die back due to ash dieback and you open up the canopy, you're going to get an increase in these light demanding species. Perhaps quite a similar effect to what you might see if you coppice an ash woodland. However, in the longer term, what we think will happen is that those light demanding species in the a typical ash woodland ground flora are likely to die out. And this is because there's going to be an increase in the shade in the ash woodland, as the species that would replace ash are almost certain to cast the far darker shade than ash. So that all sounds a bit gloom and doom, and I really don't want to be known as Dr. Doom. Um, so what can we do about it? And we were tasked with trying to think about what alternative trees could replace ash to try and su support the biodiversity that's currently found on ash. When I'm talking about um, alternative tree species. The species we put together to make our assessment for were the tree species that are already found in ash woodlands. 
So they're the ones that would um, naturally fill those canopy gap gaps and naturally regenerate in those gaps as the ash dies out. And we also included non-native tree species that would grow in the same climatic and soil conditions as ash currently occupies. When I'm talking about alternative species, I'm not talking about um, replanting, but I could, it could mean that, but it could also mean just encouraging natural regeneration of the species already present. So for each, of, um, we put together this list that had 48 alternative tree species. And for each of the 955 ash associated species, we try to find out if they would or would not use those 48 alternative tree species. So that's over 45,000 assessments we did. And this is our results. It looks a little complicated, but I'll try and talk you through it. So along the bottom here, we've got our 48 alternative tree species, and it's split into the native tree species, first of all, and then the non-natives. Each of the bars represents the 955 ash associated species. And the bar is split into three colors. So the green part represents the number of species that use ash, but would also use that alternative tree species. So for oak, um, about 650 of the ash associated species would also use oak. The black part represents the number of species that would not use that tree. So just over 200 uh, won't use oak. And the white part represents the number of species for which we couldn't find out information. So in terms of our native tree species, oak, elm and beech actually support the greatest number of the ash associated species and might be seen as good replacements for ash. In terms of the non-natives, sycamore actually came out quite high, um, supporting about the same number of ash associated species as beech. But the key thing to notice about the non-natives is the amount of white here. And this indicates that for a lot of our non-natives, we just don't know their suitability for supporting ash associated biodiversity. So if we were thinking of planting non-natives to replace ash, there's a, a risk in terms of whether they would or would not support that biodiversity. However, trees don't just support biodiversity, they also provide um, ecosystem functioning in terms of things like litter decomposition and how they influence the soil chemical properties. And if we start to replace our ash trees with other tree species, then we also need to think about how that ecosystem functioning might change. So we did a large literature review to try and gather information together about the functioning of different tree species. And I won't go into the details about the statistics behind this diagram, but this is essentially a summary of the results. And this double headed arrow here shows the gradient. And at one end of this gradient, the green end of the gradient, we have trees with low levels of carbon and lignin in their litter, high levels of nitrogen in their litter, resulting in fast decomposition. And this means that the soil around those trees generally has low levels of carbon and high levels of soil nitrogen. At the other end of this axis, we've got tree species with the high levels of carbon and lignin, low levels of nitrogen, resulting in slow decomposition. And this then follows through to soils that have high levels of soil carbon, but low levels of soil nitrogen. So you can see that ash is at one end of this spectrum, and there's very few tree species that are anywhere close to ash. So we suggest that because of this, in terms of replicating the functioning of ash, um, it could be quite hard because there's very few tree species close to it. You may remember that oak was seen as a good replacement for ash in terms of the biodiversity it supported, but oak is actually very different from ash in terms of its functioning. In contrast, sycamore, uh, which is a good non-native in terms of supporting the ash biodiversity, is actually reasonably similar to ash in terms of its functioning. However, I should point out that we only looked at a limited range of functions. Things like the shading cast by sycamore is actually quite different from ash. <laughs>
So how might we use this information? I've given you a quick run through about what we found out and what we've done, but what practical use is it to anybody? And we've tried to put this together into a database that I've called the Ash Ecole database. Um, please don't let the word database put you off. It can be a bit scary. It's not meant to be. It's really a very simple Excel file. Um, and this file contains a list of all those ash associated species. And it tells people their conservation status and what other tree species that ash associated species would use. We've written a simple guide to how to use it. Um, and both the database, the Excel file, and this guide are available for um, managers or for anybody to download from the Natural England website. Um, I've put the link there. I'll try and remember to put it in the chat later on so you can follow it up if you want to. So how would you actually physically use the, our, our database in the guide? And we've suggested there's a five step procedure that you could use um, as a tool towards um, managing ash associated biodiversity. I should stress that this is very much coming at it, assuming you've got an objective for your site of conserving ash associated biodiversity. Um, obviously there will be other objectives at your site and you'll have to um, trade off the, the factors around managing for ash biodiversity versus the other um, site objectives at the same time. But in terms of conserving ash associated biodiversity, the first thing is obviously to assess the biodiversity that you've actually got at the site. Um, often sites have already got reasonably good records. They won't be complete and we're well aware of that, but any management decision for conservation at a site is based on incomplete biodiversity records. So we're not doing anything different here than we have for decision making. You then need to um, work out what of the species that are present at your site are actually ash associated. And you can do this using our, the ash coal database. And in particular, you can work out which species are either highly associated or partially associated with the ash trees, because those are the ones with, that would be most at risk from a decline in ash. You then need to work out which other trees and shrubs those ash associated species would use. And again, you can do that using the Asher Coal database. Fourthly, you need to look at the site and see if these alternative tree species are actually present at the site. And then finally, you need to put that information all together to see um, what management you'd actually do to implement those changes in woodland composition. And we've actually done this at some case study sites. Um, so at 15 sites across the UK, we've gone to the sites and looked at them and looked at the species that are present and come up with some suggested management that you could implement if you wanted to conserve the ash associated biodiversity at the site. And we've written them up as short case studies, which are again available on the Natural England website. I'm just gonna talk you through the um, three uh, case studies that are relevant to Scotland. So firstly, Russell in the northwest. This is an 85 hectare woodland um, that's got a very high percentage of ash in its canopy, 85%. And it's got a high forest structure, but also some wood pasture. We use the um, NBN gateway combined with um, species lists from the site to work out that there were 272 ash associated species at the site. And of those, one of those species was an obligate lichen. Um, and unfortunately, we couldn't do anything with that in terms of conservation because it won't use any other tree species. But for the seven highly associated species and the 117 partially associated species, there is potentially um, management we could implement. So aspen was a tree species that would support all of those high and partially associated species at the site but it's not actually present at the site. So one option would be to introduce aspen. It would grow at the site. An alternative would be hazel, um, as hazel would support most of those high and partially associated species and is present at the site. However, it doesn't support uh, one of the highly associated lichens. Um, and this lichen requires either oak or elm. So 
because oak and elm are actually quite rare at the site, we would suggest increasing um, the, oak, the proportion of oak and elm in the canopy to help conserve that highly associated lichen. In addition, birch and rowan support many of those high and partially associated species. And they treat, these tree species do occur at the site, but only occasionally. So once again, we suggest that the management priorities would be to increase birch and rowan within the site. We need to think about how you'd actually increase those tree species. Natural regeneration is perhaps a bit unreliable. So would you actually think about planting those tree species um, in the site and increasing the abundance that way? Whether you go for natural regeneration or planting, um, herbivore protection or a reduction of herbivore numbers is definitely required. The second site is glass drum, um, a larger woodland, but with a much smaller percentage of um, oak in the canopy and a high forest structure. This site had 334 um, ash associated species. It had one obligate invertebrate and seven highly associated species and 145 partially associated species. So when we looked through the potential alternative tree species, um, most of the high and partially associated species were actually supported by these three tree species shown here. And they were all present at site, so that's quite encouraging. However, there was one highly associated moth that doesn't use hazel, oak or birch, um, but it does use hawthorn, and hawthorn is present at the site, but quite rarely. So our, our advice was that you should increase the amount of hawthorn that's present at the site. An alternative to hawthorn would be older or bl blackthorn um, that we also know that this highly associated moth uses, but that's not present at the site. So if you wanted to go down that route, you'd have to have a discussion about introducing um, new shrub species to the site. In addition, Sycamore and witch elm would support many of the highly and partially associated species that are found at the site. But they're not currently present at the site, and there might be quite a lot of discussion about whether one would really want to introduce sycamore to a site. So finally, um, for this site, we concluded that actually all the vulnerable species in terms of species that use ash are already supported by tree species that are present at the site. So we could just rely on natural regeneration, but we would need to protect the regeneration from browsing. But we might want to think about increasing the diversity of this woodland. Um, we were relying on quite a few tree species to support that biodiversity. And generally, the greater variety of tree species you have, the more resilient that site would be. So the final example I had is Cleghorn Glen down in the south. And this has only 30% of ash in its canopy. It didn't have any obligate ash associated species, but it did have two highly associated species. And then 55 partially associated species. So the highly associated moth, the only other species, tree species or shrub species that we could find that it used was privet. And privet isn't present at that site. So if we want to conserve that highly associated moth, we'd need to think about introducing privet to the site. In terms of the highly associated fungi that are fungus that's present at the site, we've got a much greater range of options. Um, Sycamore and Scots pine will both support it. And um, both those tree species are present at the site. There's also those five other tree species listed below Scots pine that the highly associated fungus would also use. And they are also um, tree species that are all present at the site, if only occasionally. So in terms of site management at, management at the site, the issue here was really around the sycamore. Um, at the moment, the um, owners had a plan to reduce the amount of sycamore at the site because sycamore was seen as a non-native tree species that was invasive. But in terms of thinking about supporting some of the ash associated biodiversity, 
we were actually recommending that the amount of sycamore they were planning to remove was reduced um, so that you kept more sycamore on the site. We were recommending that they thought about planting privet to try and support the highly associated moth and considered once again reducing the deer numbers to help um, encourage natural regeneration. So hopefully that could just gives you a flavour of how you can actually drill down into a site and come up with some very specific site recommendations to help conserve these species that are potentially at risk um, from a loss of ash within an ash woodland. Obviously, mitigation from, uh, for obligate species is not possible, but it is possible for many of our highly and partially associated species. But this does really depend on the diversity of the woodland. Some sort of intervention is often required and nearly in all our case studies, we found that um, some sort of herb herbivore control um, was required to allow increased regeneration. And there is obviously this potential for establishing additional tree species at the site if the site is lacking um, certain host tree species. So in summary, what I hope I've shown you this evening is actually the effect of um, tree health cascades far beyond an impact on just that one tree species. There's actually a far wider cascading effect that's putting many additional um, species at risk of decline. And this is something that I don't think we've really realized. However, it's not all gloom and doom. Mitigation is possible for some of these species, although obviously not for obligate species. But how much mitigation we can do will really depend on what tree species are present at the site and whether we can or cannot plant additional tree species. We also need to take into account the function of those tree species and how that might differ from ash and get to get a balance between replicating the functioning of ash and its impact on the soil properties versus supporting the biodiversity. There is this lack of data around the suitability of many of our non-native tree species. So just a sort of health risk there about planting non-natives. And sycamore, as I highlighted, has been mentioned as an alternative. Um, some people have taken this work as meaning that sycamore is the sort of silver bullet to solve all of our, our problems. It's not. Um, sycamore will support some of the ash associated biodiversity but I'd hate you to go away thinking sycamore was necessarily the best alternative. It doesn't replicate ash in terms of, for example, its shading. And really what we're thinking about is using a mixture of tree species to replace ash. Um, we're not gonna find one tree species that will replace ash. And the exact mixture that's most suitable will obviously depend on the individual site characteristics and the species that are present at that site. So finally, um, if you want any more information, I've put together a web page at the Hutton that's shown there that then provides links through to a lot of the Natural England web pages I was talking about. I'd like to thank the rest of my team who worked with me on this project. Um, obviously you for listening this evening and I'm very happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. That's fantastic. Just an incredible database, 45,000 assessments um, to go through looking at different species associations, but a, a wealth of information um, that can be used practically as well by people looking at different species associations on sites where there are issues. So, yeah, incredibly valuable resource. Got a question from Nigel Cooper um, regarding Ash Dieback. He lives in the east of England and was shocked coming up to the southwest Scotland where the impact was visually much greater. And is there any information on the relative impact of ash dieback in different regions of the UK? Paddy you might be able to answer this as well as I do, but um, I think there is. I mean, from my perspective, I think there's a lot more in the very south of England. I was down in Hampshire um, a couple of weeks ago and the impact down there looks a lot greater, but I think it's actually an indication of when ash dieback established. I think, I think the actual, in, in years to come, I suspect the actual impact might be the same. It's just that ash dieback established um, earlier in different regions. So the regions were established quicker, we're probably seeing a greater impact. Yeah, 
Um, there's some research from the continent that's suggesting that areas that are drier have less infection rates. So if you've got a damp environment, the fungus is more likely to spread. Um, so there might be sort of local regional variations due to climate as well. But I don't think that's been confirmed in the UK yet. I don't know if Paddy's got more to add to that. I can I can confirm what you're saying that I've, I've heard similar anecdotally. So colleagues that have um, recently been allowed out for um, for various different field works are kind of observing the trend further north, actually. So um, guys that are going north and west are the areas where you'd expect a fungus to do particularly well as it gets milder and wetter in the west. But a lot of that will be local site conditions, um, I suspect. So yeah, it's all anecdotal so far. Yeah. Excellent, thank you, Reef. Um, we'll carry on now with Alan, and we'll pick up any other questions at the end. So, if people do pull away, um, any questions that you do have. That's terrific. Thank you, Annie. Um, you're on mute, Danny. Yeah. Sorry, I was trying to multitask by getting Alan's presentation up. <laughs> I knew it was wrong. So, can you see the presentation firstly? Yeah, that's the main thing. So, sorry, it was just an introduction to you, Alan, um, talking about your role at, um, as Adaptation Programme Manager at Forest and Land Scotland. And Alan's going to talk us a little bit about Phytophthora and the ways that FLS have been managing it on the ground. So over to you, Alan. That's lovely. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Annie? Is that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. Excellent. Okay, so firstly, thank you very much for um, allowing us to speak this evening with you about tree health. So as Annie says, I'm Alan Gale from Forestry and Lands Scotland. Uh, I'm the Climate Change Adaptation Programme Manager uh, and so that's about adapting our forests and land for the future challenges of uh, climate change and pests and diseases. There's other people in the organisation more focused on carbon capture and emissions reduction and so on. But my job is about adapting our forests and land uh, for climate change pest diseases. So this evening I'm going to chat with you about the, the impacts of pest and diseases on the ground and the way we're, we're managing it, as it says in the slide there, or how we're coping with it, how we're uh, replacing species, how we're planning our future forests and so on. Um, initially I'll explain about our agency uh, and then a wee bit more about the bigger picture of pest and diseases, our approach that we're taking as a large land manager um, with, re with regards to manage it, but all in the context of climate change. And then some pests and diseases in, in a bit more detail, um, uh, uh, Phytophthora morum and so on, uh, that you've heard some about already, and a bit about looking forward and what we might expect in the future, um, finishing off, of course, with questions and discussion. So um, if we could get the next slide, please, Annie. Um, yeah, so... Um, firstly, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about our organisation, um, bear with me. Um, so we heard from Paddy at Scottish Forestry, um, um, as it used to be Forest Commission Scotland prior to that Forestry Commission of course, um, but then we separated as Paddy said a couple of years ago and uh, I'm in Forestry and Land Scotland, um, a very different agency from Scottish Forestry which Paddy's in. Paddy's more involved in the uh, regulation, advice and support for all forestry, whereas Forestry and Land Scotland, myself and Julie, we are land managers. We, we're the Scottish Government Agency um, with, the, with the important job of looking after Scotland's national forest and land. That's about 8% of Scotland, and as Paddy says, about a third of the of the, the forestry in Scotland we manage, two-thirds privately owned. So we manage places like Galloway Forest Park, um, Paddy showed some photos of that earlier. Uh, mountain bike places at Glen Tress and special places like Glen Moore up in the, in the Highlands. Um, so Forest Land Scotland is a public corporation. We run as a business. Um, all our income is reinvested in the benefit of Scotland's economy, environment and society. We're committed to support 
supporting Scotland's climate change plan and increasing the natural capital. But all in all, we deliver multi-benefit objectives aiming to make the best of the land in Scotland. Um, and then if we could have the next slide, please. Annie. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a bit of a story about our organisation. So now we're going to move on, talk a little about uh, pest diseases, what I call the bigger picture. Um, so let's go for that. So we do know, as Paddy says earlier, globalisation is a main reason for the increase of pest diseases. Uh, and we've seen a bit of that in Ruth's slide as well. Um, but over the, the past few decades, we have seen the, the changing climate too, as I think giving pests and diseases a helping hand, perhaps meaning that the climate is more suitable for outbreaks. And these outbreaks may accelerate or perhaps warmer winters is meaning pest diseases are not being killed off as they previously were. So we call this increasing threat of pests and diseases and climate change. We call that a synergistic effect. Now that's maybe quite a big word for an evening, but um, I think it's useful because it explains that two processes interacting and the resultant significant threats from climate change and pests and diseases together. Particularly important given our, the long rotations. We're we planting trees today that need to be suitable for 2070s, 2080s. And so if we move to number four on the slide there, uh, so that's bullet point four, um, increasing, is it having an increasing impact in our activity? Yes, this is, this is increasing all the time. You know, earlier in my career, that was many decades ago, we very rarely did pest and diseases change our approach. Uh, we would deal with a short-term issue uh, and then move on. But now it seems to me, having been in the organisation almost 30 years, we, that one new disease is coming straight after the other. And indeed, they're overlapping uh, and giving us multiple challenge, as is the case with the large disease we've seen tonight, ash dieback we've seen, and we'll talk a little about Jothostrom and needle blight. Um, so that, yeah, it is increasingly an issue. Uh, point five on the slide, um, can we predict them? Well, can we predict the diseases? pests? Well, yes, I know. Um, but if you said to me 20 years ago that we would be losing all the larch in southwest Scotland, I, I wouldn't have believed you. But of course, that's what's happened. And it's all happened so quickly. And I, I don't think we could have predicted by Topher, Remorum and Larch, because never before in the world anywhere has it uh, had an impact on conifer species like it had. Um, so the change can be fast, it can be really quite fast. And in terms of predictions, um, there is some useful modeling going on to try and calculate the impacts of things like Epstopographus and Xylella, um, typically using models and variables combined with, with the tree stock on, on the land and future climate data from Met Office, UKCP 18, to try and work out future likely impacts. And I think that's a really important research um, because it's, it's this time lag between planting and the, the many decades before the trees failed. It's got to be, it's got to be right in the future climate. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that's fine for all that predictions is fine for the pests and diseases that we know about. But of course, there's the variants uh, that we don't know about, and we've seen that in COVID as well, of course. So we don't know about the variants, and we don't know about the diseases that we don't know about. So that that's that's tricky too. Finally, number six um, on the list: uh, tree health issues is becoming business as usual, whereas previously, the 20, 30 years ago, it's not part of our business, but it is now. We're, we're planning for pests and diseases as business as usual. So that's the investment, it's resources, money, and so on. Uh, next slide, please, Annie. Yeah. So our approach. So what's our approach? Just a, a few things jotted down on the slide here. The first one there, uh, we're a member of the Scottish Tree Health Advisory Group, um, which is chaired by, by Paddy's organisation. And we sit alongside other, other land managers and, and we work together on these things. The second is the Plant Health Scotland, 
uh, centre, uh, which is really useful about sharing research and so on. So we're, we're part of that. And then three and four on the slide together, um, we, it's the Scottish Forestry Paddy's team create policy and the requirements. And then we develop strategies to respond to that. So for example, Paddy's team in the last few weeks have revised the fight off a morum policy and action plan. So I'm busy now writing a strategy for our organization to, to deal with that. Um, uh, and that, that's, that's a fairly good example where we've got a large strategy where we're making decisions that work for our organization to remove larch at the right pace, to take account of Scottish forest needs, but also so that it's the right thing for our organization as a business. And sometimes that's doing a bit more uh, proactive work with pests and diseases, uh, because we think it's the right thing to do for our risk in our business. Uh, point five, um, uh, of course, uh, like private sectors, we implement the statutory plant health notices when Scottish Forestry, the regulator, serves them upon us. Uh, we comply with planning and felling as soon as we can. And as Paddy showed one of the sites that was um, a large site and the picture of it failed. So that was one of our sites. As soon as we heard about it, as soon as we served the notice, we start planning, doing wildlife checks and so on to to, to fail it. We, we'll try and do the right thing for Scotland. Um, and then the next slide, please. Um, so you've seen some of this tonight already, but um, the ones at the top here are, are those that are affecting us now. Um, further down, uh, halfway down, we've got these other ones which are, yeah, they're, they're coming to us, I think. Um, I hope not, but I suspect they are. I guess I might be pessimistic with, with some of this, but um, Xylella um, disease, not yet in the UK, but it would, will have a significant impact on our broad leaves. And then there's this eight toothed European spruce bark beetle that Paddy spoke about earlier. And then there's two, three new breeding populations in Kent. Um, that's a concern because we've got, we've got quite, quite a portfolio of spruce. Uh, this is, um, many private sector people in Scotland. So we, we're um, watching that one closely and we're hoping that the, the regulators can stop it from coming to Scotland for as long as possible. Um, and then of course, at the bottom, there's this great unknown unknown. Um, yeah, as mentioned before, we, we don't even know about that yet. So typically it takes many years for foresters and the like to spot new pests and diseases. And there may be some unknowns in our plantations as we speak this evening, creating uh, damage to our crops. Um, and it will appear in the, in the next whenever. Well, so it's the unknown unknown. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so we're by Topper and Morum. Um, so probably no surprise this is the one we're going to talk about. We've seen some devastated sites earlier from Paddy. Um, now there's a, a next couple of slides, three or four slides, there's, going to, there's an arrow at the top. Uh, and what that arrow means is if it's going up the way, it's like a graph. So Phytophora remorum is an issue for us. It's causing us problems at the moment. So it's going upwards. It's in the upward direction. Uh, so just watch these arrows and the different diseases and pests that, that I speak about. So, okay, so Phytophora remorum, what is it? Um, number one there, it's a disease that enters the bark, kills the kills trees, we've seen some of that earlier. The spores, they spread in the wind and the mud and the needles. It's, it's some of the spores that fly about in the air, a bit like COVID spreading in the air, I think. And um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah it's, it's difficult to stop it, but felling trees is the, the, the best way. Um, I'll miss out a little bit of that because uh, Paddy's covered it, but then number two, clearing Larch from statutory plant health notices. Um, so where the infection is found, the, the only way is to fail the tree, stop the sporulation, and that's when Scottish Forestry serve us with these notices. We, we've got a few dozen notices per year over the last few years on receipt. We basically move our operational activity into that area. So our harvesters and forwarders and planners. Uh, and do, doing wildlife checks, whether it's for red squirrels or raptors, um, and, and basically moving our 
effort and activity from a, a failing area to another failing area and using the resource in the best way to stop the spread. And then the third one there is preemptive failing. This is the bit that you know, over, and, over and above what the regulator is asking of us. We've got, we've got million, millions of cubic metres of larch um, in the west coast of Scotland. And um, Paddy showed us how it was spreading. So in addition to the statutory requirements, um, we're undertaking some preemptive felling um, before the infection strike. Now, the advantages of that is that it um, stops further spread if it becomes infected, or should I say, when it becomes infected up the West Coast, because it, we, we suspect it will. Um, but it also means that we don't have the, the time tight timeline of the SPHN, because it means we can fell the larch at our own pace. Um, the, our main preemptive felling is in the leading edge of the disease. Number four, they're building roads. Um, well, that's a key part of accessing large timber. Often it's a steep ground. Getting prepared uh, by building roads is a useful approach um, because it gets us ahead of the curve. Uh, again, lots of wildlife checks, an essential part of the planning work around that. Number five, budgeting. Uh, this disease is costing Scotland a lot of money. Um, the, the sites are often difficult to work and need new access routes and means we're often shifting away from our carefully laid out forest and land management plans to fell large somewhere else. Sometimes this means leaving boundaries that are maybe not perfect from a landscape character perspective, um, but it's, it, we're tackling the disease. And a positive uh, note, though, often there's an opportunity to allow more species diversity because often the soils where the large were planted, maybe 50 years ago, the, so the soils are good, so it allows us to plant things like productive broadleaves, native broadleaves, um, firs, and so on. Um, so there we go. Check out that arrow at the top right-hand side. It's pointing upwards. The disease is causing us problems and challenges um, as a land manager. So the next slide, please. Uh, yeah. The Dothstroma needle blight, we've not spoken much about this one, but you spot the line on this one, it's, it's all going across the way. So my, my take on this disease is that it's kind of flattening out. Um, it's a bit like remorum, it's um, spores, uh, it's a disease on the needles, uh, particularly in lodgepole pine and Corsican pine. Um, we, we do surveying, number two there on the list, um, and we monitor the condition of our crops and coops and also in the Caledonian pine wood. Um, and we, we survey all of our crops once every three years. So we send out surveyors and they, they look at the foliage and they, they measure the condition. And we do that in the Caledonian pine wood once every year. Um, and then that information allows us in the crop plantations and the lodgepole pine, Corsican pine, the Scots pine, that crop information allows us then to target our failing. So we'll, we'll adjust our failing plan based on where the disease is. And over the last 10 years, we've removed 13,000, that's one 3,000 um, hectares of um, pine plantation in the north because it's become heavily diseased with Dothostroma needle blight. Um, uh, there's a lot of pine up there. We, we, we tend to have this, the biggest Dothostroma needle blight problems is in the north of Scotland. And of course, it's down in um, East Anglia as well. Um, number three, removing the uh, non-natives. Uh, what we try and do there is to protect the crown jewels of the Caledonian pine woods. We try to remove the non-natives like the lodgepole pine where there may be a risk of in infection. But, but there's a number of the Caledonian pine woods already infected and, and I know Paddy monitors them yearly also as a regulator. Um, so number four there, yeah, it is kind of levelling off this disease, I think. Um, it's not giving us the problems of some of the other diseases. But there's other strains out there, back to our COVID analogies, other strains of the disease like Dothostroma pinei um, and Scottish forestry and ourselves are checking for that each year. Uh, there's none in the UK yet, but if it did come, it may be damaging. So watching out for these different strains. Um, so take note, the, the arrow is flat at the moment, but it may change. Um, so the next slide, please, Annie. Yeah. What have we got now? Oh, we've got ash dieback now. So we've spoken a bit about ash dieback with Ruth. Thanks for that great information about, uh, about, about it. Um, I'm going to talk a bit 
but differently about it, as in the, the health and safety impact on an organisation. Um, but you'll note here that the, the arrow is facing upwards, um, and so we're in the exponential phase of this disease. Um, we, we're a few years behind England, I, I believe. Um, so we really, it's, we really need to do a lot more on it quite quickly. Um, so uh, the, what is it, number one? I'll miss that out because it's been covered. Number two, we're linked to the Ashdai Bar Risk Group Scotland, uh, which is an initiative, a great initiative by, by Scottish Forestry, um, which is ramping up activity given the evidence from the threat uh, and, and the disease in England. Uh, basically, uh, the Ashdai Bar Risk Group Scotland is all the agencies, all the key agencies and local authorities uh, working together to ramp up activity around Ash Daiba. Ruth spoke about biodiversity, which of course we're taking into account um, and working through. But for the time being, we, we're, we've got this exponential um, stage of the disease uh, with us. And so we're focusing on what's going to impact us as an organisation with things like where trees have a high likelihood of falling on on people, a property, damaging assets, and so on. So that's our, our first priority at the moment is around health and safety. So um, working closely with others in the Ash Dive at Risk Group, point four there, we've uh, developed uh, an app, which is a, a basic survey app that you can use on your, your Apple iPhone. Um, and we've trained about 70 staff in midsummer. They're out collecting information about our ash, and then we'll be taking stock, point five, um, and we'll be we've already taking it to our, our senior managers and uh, considering investment, the right level of investment to see this disease through its exponential phase um, to when it, it finishes in what, 10 or so, maybe 10. 20 years time um, depending on the pace of the disease some people say it was sooner than that so number six uh, felling plans so yeah um, we expect significant ash felling over the next five or ten years um, we'll be careful of course about wildlife checks things like bats and old trees uh, and Scottish forestry and nature scott um, are looking into this so that we can uh, manage the situation well um, so this is one that you'll see much more activity on, unfortunately, um, but the, yeah, the arrow is going upwards. So um, next slide, please, Annie. So um, predicting what's next. Um, um, yeah, number one, climate change. Um, as it progresses, as climate change progresses, obviously temperatures are increasing and we hear it in the news and so on. The, one and a half degree above pre-industrial times and two degrees and so on. And these small changes, which might appear to be small changes, have a big impact on pests and diseases. Uh, and so that's certainly an issue for us. And you know, I think some of these pests and diseases will reach a tipping point whereby the, the conditions are just right for them. So they may have more and more impact on us. Um, predicting what's next, number two, variants. Very difficult, very difficult to predict that. But we need to think about planning this as business as usual um, and knowing that we're going to need to invest in pests and diseases, which we're doing. Um, number three, this is something that it's a lead, the lead in time is short for a pest and disease. And whereas climate change, the science is clear uh, with climate change, and we can look at the graphs of increased temperature and drought and so on and that happened gradually over the next few decades but that's not the case with pest diseases but this lead in time is really short and you get the exponential phase really quickly um, number four um, yeah trees we plant today as i said 50 years time they'll be in a completely different place in terms of climate and new pest and diseases so of course uh, future forests is the, the key to that designing resilient forests, which we're doing more um, alternatives to, to sick spruce, um, more, more broad leaves um, to try and um, reduce the risk, to try and spread the risk rather than having single catastrophic events of pest and diseases. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, so this, yeah, kind of finishing off last slide here. Um, so after disease or thinking about the future forest, where the land, of course, is going to remain in forestry. So typically the larch that we're dealing with just now, for example, we fell it and then we replace it with other species that are less likely to be diseased but they're also delivering the management objectives. It's quite difficult sometimes. We're starting to run out of species because ash is getting disease, and pine is getting disease, and larch is getting disease. So we need to dig deep into to places like Douglas fir and uh, other firs, silver fir and noble fir and western red cedar and all sorts. But of course, there's still risk with them because they might be attacked by something else. Um, there's a bit of a, a legacy there, a third bullet of a bit of a legacy of the diseases, particularly we see it in southwest Scotland, where there's sometimes a bit of a moth eating effect because we've gone in and taken diseased trees out. Um, but of course, there's positives in that that allows a bit of restructuring and other diverse species. So, so finally, for me, we need to react to these diseases as we're, we're, we're all doing. You can see there's quite a bit of reaction going on, but we also need to be proactive and design our forests and land to be based on the latest evidence and taking account of, of the risk that, that is, is there. And it's this, for me, it's this, I want to close on this point of this interaction between climate change and pests and diseases uh, and I'm getting these judgments right. So that's my final slide, Annie. I think the next one is just for questions and discussion. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Alan. Um, certainly shows some of the complexities you're having to deal with. Um, I'll stop sharing now. Um, I think if we want to throw it open to questions, um, so if people want to unmute themselves and pose any of the questions to the speakers, um, I know Paddy has to head off quite promptish. Um, so if you've got any burning questions for Paddy, direct him them at him first. Um, so I'll open it up to the the audience. So Ruth, I'll ask a, I'll ask a question. Want to... oh, I was going to ask Paddy a question, if that's all right. Oh, go on, yeah, go and ask Paddy first because he has. To... Were you happy as a regulator with everything we're doing, Paddy? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, my turn. Um, um, how do I answer that? Um, yes, is the answer you want to hear, Alan. <laughs> I'll speak to you. I'll speak to you next week. Oh heck! Oh heck! No, there's the, the efforts going across across the sector are enormous, and it's appreciating the risk and a lot of the challenges with us to communicate the risks. So. Um, it's finding time and finding the opportunity to speak to groups of people to say this is why we're doing these things, um, and it's it's uh, it's a journey. So hopefully, hopefully the outcomes can be achieved that allow us to to bring the sector and the environment and that we are custodians of um, forward for future generations. Yeah, definitely, Paddy. I think there's um you know obviously we'll make this recording available to to the members as well, but I can. See, there'll be a useful synopsis we could put in the next Scottish newsletter as well for members in terms of sharing some of this information. There's been a huge amount packed into this evening. Ruth, you've got a question. Do you want to come off mute and ask it? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was just wondering about how you get that balance right between planting for a future climate versus also obviously planting for trees so that the trees survive in today's climate. And sort of how much do you rely on the trees being able to adapt um, over time versus actually planting trees from sort of southern provinces and things? Yeah, no, getting that balance is, is hard, Ruth. And, uh, you know, as a, as a forester by trade, if you like, I think one of the, the key times in a tree's life is, the, the, is today, the day it's planted. Um, and if we can, getting that tree to survive and today's climate is is the first thing um so we, we we've had very various research going on um and we, we're looking at suitability of the trees um in the first decade or two after today so looking at 2030 and 2040 and we've had research done and, and modeling done to help us see what the the um 
the suitability we like at that time. And then we have one eye on the end of the rotation also, and we've done various research through to 2080 to see, uh, for example, the impacts of drought at that time, how it'll have an effect on timber quality or the, the productivity at that time, or, or, or indeed mortality at that time, because we wouldn't want to plant something today that would die near the end of its rotation. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's really quite hard having a change in climate and a, a, a suitable species for a certain climate. Yeah, yeah. there's a challenge of long-lived trees. <laughs> yeah, I often say um, that um, a single rotation of barley is much easier because mm. you can probably switch it the following year, but yeah. we, we can't switch for 50 years. Exactly, yeah. The farmers have got it easy. <laughs> well... <laughs> I think they might dispute that one, Ruth. Yeah. I know, yeah. <laughs> I got a question. That was so yeah, question. Julie, got your hand raised? Um, it's less of a question. I suppose it's just, you know, observation being a new member of staff at, at FLS is, you know, some of the things I've looked at that I find interesting that people haven't really talked about is, you know, um, how the benefits of arboretums in the past have have shown us what grows and what grows well and you know in, in my own region in central region there there is an existing ar arboretum on cow that we're talking about expanding to use as a sort of experimentation to say you know look what grows well what grows well together you know how's it coping with climate change you know and the problem though i suppose is a lot of people won't realize is as you said is the time scales is that you know we, this is a long-term prospect but it it's that kind of thing that has to, that almost has to happen, I suppose. But then, sorry, Patty, but I also feel that there's, there, there needs to be an effort to put the right tree in the right place and not force it, I suppose. And I think that's where the importance of, you know, the work we're doing for peatland restoration is balanced out by acknowledging that sometimes we, we don't plant trees, we do the peatland restoration and then see what the habitat develops naturally, you know, in those cir circumstances where, where we get the, the sort of edge effect, where we get the ecotones, where we get the, the, the diversity naturally happening. And I suppose my worry sometimes is that we're, we're all focused on climate change and taking a, an immediate action and being like, we have to go and stick something in the ground or we have to go and do this thing. When to a certain extent, we kind of need to watch nature adapt itself and, and pay attention to that and learn lessons from that as it happens. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, incorporate that into our actions, I suppose. Yeah. Very good point, JB. And I think it's, a, it's that time lag between watching things happening, but decisions have to be made in terms of planning for future, you know, just thinking of urban trees and that knowledge exchange beyond, and then actually getting the practical side of things. Comment from Nigel, I don't know if you want to come off mute, um, Nigel Cooper. You still with us? If not, I can just relay it. May I may I respond to Julie's comments, which are totally yeah. totally right. Yeah, the um, we fell uh, and remove about three million cubic meters of timber a year in, in our organisation, and so it's um, yeah, we we. And that's a sustainable amount of felling, and we're felling and thinning and continuous cover and replanting. And I guess, yeah, I'd like to stop the clock and um, take stock and do lots of research. But of course, we, the, the trees keep growing and, and they keep dying sometimes as well. But um, so, yeah, it's just an iterative process of um, designing that future forest and the future climate and doing as well as we can, making the right judgments based on the latest information we've got. I hope that helps, Julie. Thank you, Ellen. Um, so Nigel's comment is, um, the urban forestry community is really interested in future proofing species selection, which can tie in with forestry. So there's um, a link that Nigel's posted in the um, in the chat there, so um, can have a, a look at and maybe follow up with some of the speakers as well, Nigel, if that's of interest. Has anyone else got any other questions? I've just gone over time a little, but I don't want to stop any discussions or questions. <laughs>
And if not, can I just um, take the opportunity to thank um, Paddy, Ruth and Alan for joining us tonight and uh, sharing all their vast knowledge and experience. Um, it's really nice when we can bring together some of the science with practitioners and the regulators as well and um, bring the audience together. Um, so as I say, we'll make this available to members and uh, I think there's some additional work we can carry on from this as well. Um, you know, we've got 665 SIE members in Scotland at the moment. Um, so it'd be really good to disseminate some of this information um, wider. And obviously it's just a tricky time of year, people on holiday and field work. So we'll be taking a little break from member network events. Well, for August, um, we'll be back in September. And then obviously we have the Saeem Scottish Conference um, in October, um, 5th and 7th of October on greening our grey. And um, the bookings for that will open really soon. So we hope to see some of you there. So thank you again, everyone. And um, we'll be sending out the recording to everyone booked tonight and a, a feedback form that'll be done by my colleague, um, Drew, in probably next week. So do have a look out for that. And thank you for joining everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your holiday. <laughs> Enjoy Fort William. <laughs> Climate Bye. change in effect. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.